Speaking about kind of really cool science, I mean, we're really not, we've kind of touched on a little bit, but the CDK4-6 inhibitors. And I think that, you know, at least personally, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, the more scientifically oriented members of this panel, um, did you a priori think they were going to work in luminal A disease? I mean, really? Did, I mean, we knew, where did that come from? You know? That came from a very important uh, screen done by colleagues at UCLA. Right. Uh, correct. And um, so actually, I'm, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, I would argue that in, for example, in triple negative disease, uh, many of us thought that it would be unlikely that they would work just because of the high prevalence of loss of RB. Right. Uh, in, trip, in HER2 positive, I, I don't know that we, I, I personally did not anticipate, but I'm not surprised that they're good in luminal. No, a good point. The RB loss in triple negative, I think, is And where, estrogen receptor, and remember, estrogen receptor, a major target of estrogen receptor is cycling D1. Yeah. So MIC and cycling D1. So, so I think it's not, it's intuitive that it would work in that setting. So given that, um, Kim, let's talk about kind of things that were discussed at ASCO, uh, presented at ASCO this year. And I think uh, the big news really is Paloma 3, yeah. among other, we'll talk about a bunch of other CDK4-6 inhibitors, but the first one really was palpociclib and Paloma 3. Can you kind of summarize that for us? Yeah, so we now have three trials that basically look at the addition of palpociclib um, to anti-estrogen therapy, endocrine therapy, both fulvestrin and letrozole. And what we see across the board is almost a near doubling, if you round, give or take a month or two, in progression-free survival with the addition of the palbo to the endocrine therapy backbone. So very exciting. Um, you know, to date, we've not seen a survival benefit in part because this is a population of patients that's very hard to see a survival benefit in. And so I think we're quickly approaching a time where this becomes a standard of care for everyone receiving endocrine therapy in the metastatic setting. I mean, so preliminary abstracts from this trial, you know, show that it's a 24-month yeah. progression-free survival. It's two years for first-line therapy for metastatic disease. I mean, those of us have been, we've all been in this business a long time, and to kind of see that is fairly substantial. Um, and I guess the question is, you know, if it does become the standard of care, you know, what are the role of some of these other things? Um, I think that, you know, first of all, let's talk, before we talk about that, let's talk about um, other uh, uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors. I mean, we have data now from the Monarch series of trials, the first presentation uh, of um, abemaciclib. Um, uh, you know, Joyce, do you want to talk about abemaciclib? Yes, abemaciclib is a more CDK4 than CDK6, so it has a less myelosuppression because it doesn't get as much um, CDK6, but has more GI toxicity, anorexia, diarrhea, some nausea, although that tachyphylaxis over time. But because it's not myelosuppressive, it can be given daily, so you don't have to have the three weeks on, one week off, which may end up being a therapeutic advantage at the end of the day. We will have to wait for randomized trials. But it's a very interesting agent because it's showing that in terms of the data we have so far, the most activity later line. We're waiting for early line trials. The Monarch series are coming earlier with letrozole and fulvestrin, but um, presented here are data from a large phase two trial, about 120, 30 patients, um, later line, fairly heavily pretreated patients, single agent of emocycle, again without an ER um, antagonist, showing a response rate of 17%, but impressively, a clinical benefit rate of 42%, which is quite impressive, you know, for this single agent. So a very uh, powerful CDK4-6 inhibitor. We wait for, um, you know, earlier line studies. The other thing about it is it penetrates the CNS. And um, I have a patient who's been on it over three years now with multiple brain metastases. I have another patient who went to the University of Colorado to participate in their ongoing CNS-directed uh, therapy right now. She's responding. So it's a really exciting agent as well for brain metastases. I think, it was, you know, what was really appealing to me when we looked at the data was, is the duration of response sustained? And, and, you know, because the response rate is very important in the setting, but are these people going to be able to maintain on this treatment for a long period of time? And the duration of the response for those patients responding was close to nine months, 10 months. And in heavily pretreated patient population, all of them had taxane, half of them had capecitabine. That's a pretty, impressive. and that's, that's a it good result. Yeah. And I must say kudos to FDA because they gave breakthrough designation to abomocyclib, they gave breakthrough designation to palbocyclib, right. and they bet on it. 
and now we have seen you know positive trials the of both Coloma correct. two yeah. now with Monarch one. Mm -hmm. well, it's working. The process is working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the PFS of six months. You think about all the other trials, even in the first line endocrine therapy. You know, three point eight months that we've seen with exemustane and fulvestrant. So this is. Yeah. A near doubling, I like that term, near doubling. I'm going to use that a lot at this meeting. You know, near doubling in PFS for patients who really had run out of endocrine based options and had received chemotherapy. So, although the response rate of 17% was a little underwhelming, I think the PFS, the duration of response, I think those are the really exciting things to come out of that study. And the thing that really excited me, I think, Sunil, is to your point. The overall survival of that patient group was 17.7 months. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is, in that group, it's heavily pretreated like that. Yeah. And we know from the uh, EMBRACE trials of Arubula, even though it's not quite the same correlation, the overall survival is about 13 or so months with Arubula. It's yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah, the notion that a targeted therapy, the suggestion that a targeted therapy would be better in chemo, to chemotherapy in this setting, you know, a few years ago would have been almost heretical. Right. I know, yeah. this is like really a you real know, sea change. Like, wow. things are and going. You're, what you're doing is you're basically adding in, you're plugging in another agent in that continuum of metastatic breast right. cancer therapies right. that is giving you the six months PFS, that is giving you this response rate. So I think that allows us to have an option now in patients and hopefully it's going to yeah. improve survival. It's the first targeted therapy, if we exclude endocrine therapy, which we've had for a long time, that's used as a that's single true. agent to demonstrate activity. You can't say that about any of the, you know, to date, the approved HER2 targeted agents. I mean, um, so I think it's pretty exciting to have a single targeted therapy that's been demonstrated. Well, the other activity. thing is that a lot of these patients have ER positive disease. And this is a drug just because it may work in the same axis that it may dispense the need uh, of uh, the simultaneous uh, anti-estrogen therapy. That may be beneficial for the quality of life of some women. Yep. Absolutely.